Hello, everybody. Welcome back. And let me welcome an old friend of mine, Miss Pat Weaver. Uh, I forgot to throw in my applause thing, but yay. <laughs> <laughs> I've known Pat for, I don't, do you realize we've probably known each other at this point for like 15 or more years? I think you're right. It flies. It really yeah, flies by. Down. Anyway, um, she's a pretty special person. She's had an incredibly varied background and uh, just, I don't know, really, really, really smart person. And I enjoy her, her company in her brain. Um, Pat is currently head of production at Warner Chapel Production Music, um, overseeing production facilities in Nashville and Los Angeles. She's a veteran music industry pro with expertise in music for picture production, the founding and managing of production music libraries, music supervision, audio branding, and business development. See, I told you she had a, a really varied background. Uh, prior to joining uh, Warner Chapel in 2019, she served as creative director of global music services for Discovery, where she oversaw music for a wide variety of networks, including the Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, TLC, and ID, as well as a global team of music supervisors. She managed the curation and commissioning of music content for Discovery's large internal production music library, Discovery Music Source, consisting of over 130,000 tracks. And she helped pair composers with various series for custom music, including Discovery Channel's Alaska The Last Frontier, Shark Week, yay, Alaska Bush People, Homestead Rescue, Vegas Rat Rods, can't say I've ever watched that one, uh, TLC Little People, Big World, Long Lost Family, out daughtered, that's me, I've got four daughters, uh, and several Animal Planet shows, including Tanked, Treehouse Masters, Northwoods Law, and Lone Star Law. Her experience with original music production includes long-term stints as an executive producer at two of LA's top custom music houses, Emoto, which is formerly Ad Music. You and I, I don't know if we ever talked about that, but I used to be the general manager of LA Studios and worked with Angie Height. We're all under the same roof and owned by the same people. So we got to have that combo sometime. Um, and she also worked at, and I can never get this right, but I'm going to try Music Vergnugen. Did I nail it? Close enough. <laughs> Where she oversaw custom music for award-winning commercials for Nike, Microsoft, Sprite, The Gap, Mercedes-Benz, Lexus, etc., as vice president of new channels at Elias Arts, another renowned LA-based music house, she was instrumental in the launch of their production music library, Elias Plays, which was eventually sold to Universal. Having begun her career, Ben, you've done everything. Her career as an editorial assistant at Rolling Stone and New York Magazine, I mean. Uh, Pat headed up the West Coast Press and Publicity Division of Capitol Records, where she helped develop the public profiles of such diverse artists as Tina Turner, Duran Duran, Thomas Dolby, and Iron Maiden. She later served as manager of public relations for the Turner TV Network and director of marketing for Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab, a revered audiophile label. I want to add that Pat was also a much-valued member of Taxi's A&R team for a couple of years so some of you watching may have actually had your your music screened by this lady back I don't know 2007 8 somewhere around there. So um, welcome Pat and thank you for doing this. I really do appreciate it. All that resume. I didn't know you were given the full full one. Um, <laughs> either I can't keep a job or I'm really old. <laughs> Well, or you're really talented. A lot of people have wanted you for various things. But, you know, I, I wanted to do the full resume just so that people can understand the depth of, of your experience. Because, you know, I, honestly, I get really upset. The most offensive thing you can say to me about Taxi is, oh, they used interns to screen the music there. And uh, you're certainly a couple of notches better than an intern. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yes. You know, I learned a lot from the taxi screeners. It's a really diverse group of producers and musicians themselves and people in the business. And for me, it served a wonderful purpose because I had my own song library at the time and uh, I could screen and place. Um, so it was a beautiful setup for me. It was, and, and I remember, um, Excuse me, your catalog was called Lake House Sound, if I remember. Um, yeah, I'm old, but I still have my faculties. <laughs> um, and, and you were really picky about what you signed. Uh, you know, I was going to ask you this, and then I decided not to go down the road, but as long as we're on the subject, 
So many people think, oh, I don't need a library. I don't need anybody representing my music. I, I don't want to give away half the money. I'm going to reach out to music supervisors on my own. You're about, you and Michelle Bell are like Olympic level networkers. You, you ladies are not afraid to reach out to people. You don't fear somebody not taking your call or answering your email or saying no thank you. Even though you're that good, it's hard, isn't it? it to, to get people to respond and then to get them to listen and then to get them to use the music. It's really tough. You know, especially in the position I'm in now, I've been with Warner Chapel three years, uh, heading up production. And we're inundated with composers, singer songwriters um, who want to be in the business or already are in the business or they're doing their due diligence and networking and the competition is fierce. So I imagine the music supervisors have the same issue. They're getting inundated. And so they depend on their gatekeepers just like I often depend on gatekeepers. I depend on referrals um, from trusted sources, you know, and I'm sure they do too. So there's all sorts of backdoor methods, which I work better than cold calling the, the de final decision maker. Yeah. Um, some of the taxi placements I did were because I met a female editor on a CW show at a group dinner party. And she was complaining that um, she wasn't happy with the music supervisor on their team and she wasn't getting the music she needed. And she had a really difficult scene she was working on. I wasn't even a music supervisor at that time. I didn't even have my own company at that time. I just said, well, I know a bunch of bands that do that kind of music. Why don't I gather some tracks for you and send them over? So I, I sent over a CD of 12 different songs and four of them got licensed like that. So the woman that was the music supervisor was, I won't say her by name, but she is the music supervisor in town and she had her own shop. She never took my calls. She didn't. <laughs> Did she never responded to my emails? I could not get in, I you know, any way. And it turns out that the editor just slipped my cues in. And um, next thing I know, her people are calling me saying, we'd like to license four tracks from you. Who are you? What do you do? And why don't we know about you? Because <laughs> you don't take so, my damn call. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, networking isn't just with the top tier. You have to network on with the people that are hands-on. Absolutely. Um, you know, let me go to this one. Now, you've done so many aspects of music for media. That, that's what makes you so interesting to me. I mean, you've done advertising, you've done li the library side, you've done supervision, you've corralled, you know, probably a dozen or two supervisors, uh, you know, in the whole discovery universe um there's a common myth i believe amongst people who don't really know our little corner of the industry which has gotten to be not such a little corner anymore finally getting a little love out there from the, the record side of the industry like wow they're making money over there but a lot of musicians think that it's about writing hits my song is so good they're going to want to use it they don't really understand the concept of filling a need a very specific need so what gets used, an amazing A-plus song that doesn't really nail the brief or an A-minus that does? Boy, um, the A-minus, you know, I hate to say that because I'm a real stickler and fan of good production. So A-minus is about as low as we'll go to uh, even send out a song to be pitched. Um, it has to be really well produced. So, you know, when music supervisors are looking for a song, if we're talking about songs, um, they usually have a reference 
you know, um, sometimes they don't, but a lot of times more and more these days they have a reference. Um, and if your track's already in an online library, usually the music supervisor will upload her YouTube link and it'll search um, for something similar. So um, reference tracks are huge. Not telling people to go copy all the hit songs, although some libraries do that. Um, but yeah, you're, you're in the business. And when you're in the production side of the business, not the artist label side, but the production music side of the business, you're creating or dealing in music that's helping content creators tell a story. And if your song or piece of music doesn't nail that story or that moment that's critical to the whole story arc, they, they can't use it. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. Do the, I do the shoe store comparison. When I was a teenager one summer, I had to fill in for the shoe lady uh, in the shoe department of my parents' little store in a farm town in, the, in Illinois. And, uh, you know, if a woman came in looking for a beige 7.5B pump with a 3.5-inch heel and I brought her out a, a gentleman's bass Weijin penny loafer in Cordova 9.5D, they're both great shoes. One of them fits her knee, and the other one is like, what the hell are you thinking? It's, it's very, very analogous to music. It's the, this is what I need because this is the topic. This is what we're doing in the scene. This is the emotion we need to bolster in, the, in this particular scene. So, I mean, yeah. I did say that part of our business, we do custom music too, but part of our music are customizations. So, especially with advertisers, they'll find a track, they, they love the groove, Sometimes they'll want to replace the vocals with uh, different vocals singing stuff that's more in tune with whatever their product is. So we we do that kind of work. That that goes back to a good solid song and production still can have a life. It might morph into something else uh, for somebody's particular use. You know, while we're on this topic, um, I find it funny, maybe a little ironic, that oftentimes the advertising community is looking for songs. They love songs from authentic artists that actually have a story and a little bit of a career. Um, and, and they will license a song and then not use 90% of the vocal or maybe none of the vocal at all, just use the instrumental track. It's like, why didn't you just go to a production music library and look through instrumental tracks? Because they now sound oftentimes like records and they don't have a vocal. But for whatever reason, I, I just find it ironic that they're looking for an authentic artist with somewhat of a story and then they don't use the vocal or the artist that's just all instrumental. A am I imagining that or have you seen that as well? No, it's, it's, it's crazy. And this is why we still put out lots of songs in our catalogs. Um, but I would say nine times out of 10, they'll pick a song because it's a song and it has a, a cool vocal on it and they understand songs. You know, not all music supervisors are musicians or music aficionados. Um, they, like everyone else in the music business, everyone comes from a different, unique background. So if songs are what they get and the easiest, they'll often be drawn to a track because it's this it's a catchy song and then they they don't use the vocal. Yeah. About nine times out of ten. Uh, I agree with so you that like they have the vocal for just to get the song the instrumental licensed. Right, over the transom. <laughs> yeah. I find that uh, you're absolutely right, that probably 60%, 70% of the people that we all work with can speak music in musical terms. They can pretty accurately describe genres, which seems to get harder and harder every year because there's so much overlap. Um, but a, a lot of editors, and, and let's face it, editors place a lot of music, um, and uh, they may or may not be a musician. I don't think an editor sits there and thinks, I'm going to look for a pop R&B track with this kind of vocal delivery. They just think, 
I need something that's poppy and upbeat and makes you feel good. And they probably search more by title. They look for something in the title that drops a hint about what it's going to sound like. So do you find that, um, do you guys title stuff? And I don't want to get into retitling in that other context, but do you find that you guys need to touch up titles so that editors can more easily identify when a piece of music is right for a need? You know, this business is all about metadata and tagging, and it's it's a endless hellhole that <laughs> never, never leaves your side. It's always an ongoing issue of how to tag your music. The title becomes less important than how you're tagging it. Um, in the system, you know, and if, if it's in a library, it's going to be tagged. It's going to have a genre, a main genre. It's probably going to have three sub genres. Um, it's going to have some keywords that you apply to it. Um, and a description of the track and whether it's a male or female vocal, or it's a duet or it's fast or slow. So really when it gets right down to it, they'll find that music, regardless of what the title of the music is. And actually on our site, the titles of the tracks aren't, uh, well, no, they are searchable. I take that back. They are searchable. Um, so yeah, we, you don't want to be way off base with it Yeah. or, you know, you want to kind of be in the, in the world of what that music's about. Um, and, and same with the albums in a library you can have fun with what you call an album let's call it you know take off but you you need a tagline it's it's very anti-artist in that way you know artists aren't going to put a tagline on their album um <laughs> but if it's in a library you need that tagline that says take off you know uplifting female pop rock um so yeah people people will find it if you tag it correctly um, I find that uh, there are people who tag well and people who don't. I mean, a lot of musicians can't objectively tag their own stuff because they've never been in the user's position to know what kind of tagging would resonate with the user. So most artists, you know, smart ones, dedicated ones, still don't often get it right. I've also seen some libraries, because uh, I, I spend an awful lot of time stalking libraries online just to learn more about their vibe or if they have orchestral that's getting long in the tooth because the samples are from 10 years ago. I may call up the library owner and go, you know, your stuff sounds a little dated. Can we help you freshen that up? But I see the tagging and go, who tagged this stuff? It's like really poorly tagged. And I think they might be using interns and the interns don't know because they don't have experience. Then again, somebody with your years of experience and your ears, you're too expensive and you have bigger fish to fry than tagging. So where do you find that balance on who's the best tagger in an organization? Yeah. Like I said, it is just a hell hole. I, <laughs> my eyes see every single Excel metadata sheet that goes up on our site. It doesn't create the metadata, you know, I don't create that and I don't look at every single column because there's hundreds of fields on one Excel spreadsheet um, for an album. Um, but I do look across them and I do change a lot. And we have a team that does our metadata so that they kind of understand our perspective and how we want our metadata done. Every library kind of has its own approach. I mean, there's basics, but some things are subjective. But if someone's using your library a lot, they get to understand um, how to find what they need within your, you know, taxonomy. So yeah, I look at um, the CD description, I often rewrite that. And yes, someone else should be doing it, but um, <laughs> usually do that in the evening. And I look at category and subcategory, because those are the key things um, that'll help you find yeah. music. We have a lot of third party catalogs from overseas and some of them don't speak um, English as, as well as they might. And I'm correcting 
bad grammar, you know, sometimes too. Um, or somebody will talk about, this, there's a great, you know, this album features the zither when there's no zither on it. <laughs> <laughs> Come hither, <laughs> zither. Like, get to my desk. It went through so many eyeballs and nobody actually listened to the music. Or we have an oh, instrument. Called, there's no zither listed. So, yeah. Even though we pay to have our metadata done, you, somebody internally that does have experience has to have eyeballs on it. Makes perfect sense. I feel your pain. I really do. Um, <laughs> let's talk a little bit. People think that music supervisors are like A and R people. Um, there, I, I don't know why, but they think if a supervisor just hears how good my song is or my music in general, they're going to start putting me in all kinds of stuff. They don't really understand that they're looking to fill a particular need at a particular point in time. Um, when you were at Discovery, can can you describe the process? You were, if I remember correctly, your job description, I'm giving the abbreviated version, was you were kind of mother hand to all the supervisors that worked on the various projects. Is that correct? Yeah, I was creative director. So I oversaw in-house music supervisors, um, you know, several in the U.S., and then we had a U.K., music supervisor and the external music supervisors i did not have much to do with them well that's not true it just depends discovery you know every network works differently yeah and um at discovery we had an internal library which i curated um and so my job was to help create playlists for the shows from our library just like it's the in-house music supervisor's jobs and to create custom music. We didn't um, look for external music to place. That's not to say shows didn't do that. Um, we didn't work with all the shows. There were hundreds and hundreds of shows. So we didn't, um, some of them would, we didn't deal much with songs, quite frankly. Right. I mean, there was Animal Planet, Discovery Channel, TLC, ID, then it goes on from there, and um, very few songs. So each show has its own musical palette, and I'm guessing that you would work with the supervisor who oversaw a particular show, and that ultimately, tell me when I'm wrong, excuse me, because I'm just doing this from guessing, knowing the industry in general, would that supervisor curate the stuff that went into bins for the editor? So the editors didn't make, they made the, the almost final choice because they would lay the music in when they were cutting. And then I'm sure that the music supervisor, maybe even the EP would give notes and say, well, yeah, that third cue, not as happy as I was looking for. But ultimately you would oversee the supervisors for the various shows. The supervisors would take, let's say two, three, four different libraries, including the internal stuff at, at Discovery. Whittle that down to anything that's in this bucket could be used on your show. Now pick it and make us happy. Is that kind of the sequence of events in the process? Well, again, all networks work differently. So the way Discovery worked, um, we, I was a music supervisor. I oversaw the music supervisors, but I also was a music supervisor. So each of us had X amount of shows. I remember the most shows I ever had at one time was 17 shows. How could you do all that? Where did you it's, find the time? And it's a, it's a combination of custom and library. So we only dealt with, so I worked direct and most shows couldn't afford their own music supervisor. They didn't hire music supervisors. Um, now, if you go to, you know, um, uh, NBC, lots of those shows have their own music supervisor. Um, but a lot of discovery, you're dealing directly with the um, showrunner or the editor, um, or sometimes the production company will have an in-house music supervisor that you're dealing with. So music, so in-house music supervisors are dealing with external music supervisors and internally, we're just feeding them music from the discovery library. Mm. Um, 
The show itself is getting other libraries signed on as needed. So oh. they look at, so we're just another contributor at that point. So um, some networks, you have to use the library, in-house library. As a matter of fact, a lot of networks, they have signed deals with like, let's say 10 different libraries and um, you have to use those libraries. I can't speak for Discovery these days, but when I was there, it, we were just optional. So we had to be good. We had to be competitive, but we had an advantage because we could sit in on the production meetings and we knew exactly what was going on with all the shows, when they were looking for music, um, who was looking for music, what what the nature of the show was. Um, I hope that helps. It's just one. No, it does. It shows the complexity of what goes on behind the scenes because I think many of the musicians, creators, composers, songwriters, and artists think that I'm going to play Pat Weaver, my awesome song. She's going to love it and get it in a TV show. They don't know about all the different permutations, you know, the different paths that result in a piece of music ultimately ending up in a show. It's not as simple as... Pat Weaver meets me at a barbecue. Here's my awesome song sitting in the car in the driveway and goes, oh, that's awesome, George. I'm going to put it in a TV show. It's nothing like that in reality. <laughs> no, but strange things do happen. I was at a Harvell's once. <laughs> yeah. And some, I was wearing a brand new leather jacket and some guy spilled, spilled beer all over it. <laughs> and I looked at him and he just like shrugged and walked off. And I was enraged. And his friend is very young, ends up employee, comes over to me and says, I'm so sorry for him. Um, he's usually not like that. Let me buy you a drink. We just finished wrapping production on a show in Romania and we're celebrating. And I, at this point I had my own company. And I said, a show? What kind of show? <laughs> Oh, it's going to be on Cinemax, and um, I can't remember the name of it. And um, I said, "What are you doing for music?" He goes, "You know what? I don't know. I don't. I don't think we've even thought about music yet." And I, I said, "Oh, I'd love to meet this gentleman that spilled beer on my jacket." So he takes me over there, introduces me to this guy. Um, I, I give him a hard time about the jacket, and then I talk about the show. Ends up yeah they need uh, a theme song so i got busy he did pay for dry cleaning on my jacket nice but we sent him uh, we had a creative meeting um i sent him seven different vocal songs fully produced um at no charge when when it out of pocket for it and um they chose one and that was the most random thing and i'm still getting uh royalties and this was probably i don't know 12 years ago 13 years ago all that from a spilled um, so beer that networking thing you just have to always be ears open yeah like i said you and michelle bell you, you ladies are the best networkers i've ever met in any portion of my several careers i'm not unlike you you know i've with general manager of LA Studios, before that, uh, Howard Schwartz, HSR in New York, before that, Criteria in Miami. So in each of these capacities, I've known a lot of industry professionals. I've never met anybody who uh, is as dogged and good at it as you and Michelle. By the way, she was my keynote at the rally and she was awesome. She's, uh, do you know, she's now um, head of creative at Rock Nation. Uh, yeah, so I've, I've watched her climb the ladder of success. I'm very proud of her. Let's go back to theme songs for a minute. Honestly, this is something that I don't know enough about. Um, I remember you actually ran a listing for Naked and Afraid, looking for a theme song for that many years ago through Taxi. And um, I know you can only speak from your own experience, but can you enlighten us as to how theme songs, who decides what they need for a theme song? Is it the showrunner? Is it the music supervisor? Is it the network that decides we're looking for this kind of theme song? Maybe these are some lyrical ideas or hits that we specifically need to grab. 
um, who auditions them, where do they come from, what's the process, the whole thing, from literally from soup to nuts on theme songs. Please elucidate. Well, from I can only speak from my experience. Um, it's usually the network that decides if there's even going to be a theme song. Um, if you'll notice more and more, there's um, kind of a animated logo hold for five seconds and you're into the show. Yeah. There is no song or theme. And then as you get more uh, higher up into the scripted realm and out of reality, there's more elaborate songs. Um, but for, from my experience, it's it's the network that decides. It A lot of things go into that decision. Um, I mean, it's it's incredible the analytics that networks can do on when viewers change channels, whether a 30 second theme impacts whether viewers hang in there and continue watching versus a five second theme. Um, so it just depends on what the property is, meaning the show, who's that audience and is that audience going to be responsive to a, a theme song? And if the decision's yes, we think they are, then um, it's a big creative group, um, chaotic mess about, well, what direction do we go? And um, I've been involved several times where they, they want a theme song. We do the demos and, you know, Usually, sometimes they'll license an existing song. A lot of it's, they want a custom piece. Um, and several times we've jumped through the hoops and you it has to sound great. It has to be fully produced. Only for them to say, you know what? We're just going to do the five second um, ID and logo oh, after all. So, you know, uh, it's crazy, but the themes, they do pay more, obviously. Um, and Discovery did license songs for um, themes as well as create themes. I don't know if that's helpful at all. No, it, it is. It shows that there's no one way that's predominantly the way. Um, I don't know, if, chances are you're not going to remember because it's been a, a lot of years, but Keith Lubrant, one of our members. Oh, you re Oh no, you know um, Pedro Costa. That's who you met at one of the road rallies. And you basically launched his career because you inspired him. You said, you know, you're pretty darn good if memory serves. And he just floated out of that road rally. He was so inspired. He's very successful now. I, I love that man. He's like so honest and good his library is doing great i just saw him at the rally and we were talking about you for a moment um anyway from that same vintage group of taxi members there was also another gentleman named keith lebrant um who's a computer programmer by day does music part-time makes a pretty substantial income i don't know how he finds the time he's got i want to say well over a hundred thousand hold on he's got 105,455 placements on 1,700 TV shows on 283 networks. If you'd like me to introduce you, I will. <laughs> Clearly, he's doing something right. He's a monster guitar player. I mean, he's like Steve Vai, Joe Satriani, talented and loves to play that kind of stuff. But I called him up, said, Keith, I need a favor. Uh, I want to create a theme. When we were doing the virtual road rallies during the lockdown, I needed a theme. And I said, I, I don't want to, um, you can't have any publishing on I don't care if I get any publishing. I just don't want it to get us bounced on uh, on YouTube when we put the shows up there. So you can't ever like give it to a library or, or publish it in any way, shape or form. Um, I'll do you a solid somehow, somewhere, someday. But yeah, about an hour later. Oh, and he said, what's my direction? I said, ZZ Top meets Joe Walsh solo album. I need it to be rock, but not too masculine. I need it to be kind of fun. 
you know, it's us. It's Taxi's membership. What does that feel like to you? An hour later, he sent me a thing and said, here's a demo, and it's what you heard at the beginning of this show. And the demo was so good, I called him up and said, that's it. And he goes, no, 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 that's only a demo. I, I want to do a real... I said, no, exactly what you just sent me is perfect. It's like it, you couldn't have hit the nail more on the head. And an, another hour later, I got all the cut downs from him. So it's so awesome to find people like that that take direction super well, deliver super fast, consummate pro. And I remember thinking to myself, that's the difference between people who make a six-figure income in sync and those who don't. He just, you know, maybe, what, 10, 20% of all are kind of that good. And those end up becoming your go-to people that you know you can always rely on. Such a pleasure. <laughs> Well, it is, we work with probably, I'd say 150 composers at any given time all around the world. And we have a system. We put out, um, including our third party catalogs, which we distribute worldwide, and the music, LA, Nashville, Hamburg, Paris, London, they all create music for Warner Chapel. We have offices in all those regions. We put out an average of about, it used to be 40 albums a month. Now it's gone up to 60 albums a month. Wow. How many so, tracks do you have in the library? Like 130K or something? So I think it's up to 150,000 unique tracks. It's, it's a little too big, if you ask me. It's unwieldy. But it, it is what it is. So um, it's a machine and the music clearly has to be good, but we get, um, <laughs> I should probably go into this, a little political, <laughs> but we get asked by our parent company, Warner Chapel Music, which is a publisher, um, to work with some of their songwriters for our library. And while it sounds great in theory, and there's some super talented songwriters on their roster who would love to be in the library business, and we do do that on occasion, there's so much hand-holding involved. Because just because you're a good songwriter does not mean you're a good producer. Um, it may not even mean you're a great singer. So that means we have to find a producer, we have to maybe hire a singer, we have to um, help them get charts made and hire musicians. We, we, it's too expensive. So in the production world, we're really spoiled. People deliver finished goods. That's it, they're just, now we do mix everything in house um, that we commission. Um, so that's one, level of quality control we do but it needs to arrive not only in the box.com folder we told you to use <laughs> yes <laughs> like <laughs> your box please um but it needs to sound great and then you deliver the sessions to us and we we mix it and um we involve the uh, composer in that process as well. So I guess my, my point is um, you, you could be super, super, super talented, but the production music industry may not be for you right. because if you don't have really great samples, if you don't have the money to have a home studio where you can, you know, generate this, this quality, broadcast quality music that we need, um, nobody's gonna license that piece of music, you know? I have an idea. Uh, okay. Um, of course, Taxi's gonna be involved in this, but you know, uh, seriously, you would be aghast to see the level of people that we've got in Taxi now, because for so many years, we've been teaching them about the production music side of the industry. And, and we have a pretty large group of members that are world-class, that are in all the libraries that count. 
Um, they get a lot of custom requests. The libraries send them briefs directly every day. Um, it's actually bad for taxis model because we get people to a level of success where they don't need us anymore because they're dealing directly right. with the libraries and they become the go-to people for those libraries. I'm thinking that when Warner Chapel is handing you these songwriters saying, can't you, you know, incorporate them because they're trying to generate income for them. We should run taxi listings without saying who the writer is and come up with a good brief where the members submit, then you pick the people that you would like to pair them up with. These are people that have the studio, that know the drill, that have the chops, and basically for free can hand hold these writers through the process and just do a split with them on it. Interesting. Yeah, we should, <laughs> we should talk after the rally and find a way to at least try that, like do one or two passes and see if it works because that solves your problem of having to go through all those motions to make the mothership happy when there's a way we can do it for free. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But you know me well enough to know that I'm not going to exaggerate this to you. Trust me. We have people well, that it'll work with. We, we do work that way already, but we go into pocket to do it. Um, we hire independent producers to work with, a singer songwriter and some of our best material happens that way it's just more expensive and time consuming but gosh you end up with some great great stuff um all right we can talk about that yeah give me a chance to have you go wow taxi's really grown since i was there last um and i want to let the folks in in the chat room know that i am gonna i'm i was sorry if there's something i want to do a live q a um, Pat can't see the questions, so I'm going to curate the questions to feed her. And in about 10 minutes, we'll probably start doing some Q&A. So get your questions ready. Please make, make them pithy. Um, not pissy, pithy with a TH. <laughs> um, let's, let's talk about professionalism. Um, a lot of people think that it's all about the music. And I would strongly contend the music is a given. The music has to be there, but your personality, your level of professionalism, um, delivering things on time, getting it in the right file folder, you know, it's, and some people just think I'm so gifted, so talented, so wonderful that they're just gonna give me a pass. I don't have to do all that businessy stuff because they'll do it for me or hold my hand because I'm just awesome. How important is getting all those seemingly not that important to them things correct for you to make you want to keep working with them over a long period of time? It's essential. It's if, if we may make an exception once <laughs> because we don't know yeah. until we work with a person, but we have it's a, like I said, it's a machine. I hate to put music and machine in the same sentence. Um, but we have a certain protocol and it's an assembly line and things move down that assembly line. And when it's working seamlessly, we get the releases out in a timely manner. When it's not working seamlessly, you're, it's a, it's a headache. And it's the smallest thing, you know, we have delivery specs. We update those, we go over them, we, we argue about them, you know, so we've come up with the delivery specs that work best. Um, we send those out. It's got file naming conventions on there. It's got what format you need to deliver and where you upload it. Um, everything, if there's a chink in the chain, it's, it's it gets lost and dropped often. It's like, whatever happened to those tracks? Oh, I sent those, I emailed you several MP3s. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's the worst possible thing you can ever do. So like I said, you know, one, one trial with that kind of individual you just don't have time to do it again no matter how great the music is you just it it's you just don't have the time and time is so everything. valuable it's it's everything you know as it is my 
days are really long. And I have a guy who's so talented and I do keep working with him, but every time I do, I'm just like, oh, this is the last time. <laughs> and it's never the last time because he has a unique um, niche that he covers that's kind of difficult to cover, but he never uploads where he's supposed to upload. You'll sign off on six demos. These are great. We just need to add in some really authentic ethnic percussion. Um, you need to finesse the ends and um, we're good to go. And this is actually just happening right now. Next thing I know, he disappears for weeks. He comes back with 10 completely new tracks. Here you go. And they're good. But what happened to the six? that we massage together, where did those go? And oh, I can beat those. <laughs> because, well, these are, these are good. If you could have all of them, you know, just let me know which ones you want. So that's crazy making and um, infuriating. That's an extreme example of someone that still manages to be successful, but everybody he works with, he drives crazy. Yeah. Um, but it's not recommended. One of our library CEOs you probably know well, um, and I'm sure that you screen stuff for him back in the day because they've been running listings with us forever. And I think at this point, we, taxi members are a large portion of, of his catalog. Um, I picked up, I heard a taxi member that was a singer songwriter, extremely special. It's like a once every five year thing that you hear and go, this one, perfect. And I connected him directly with that library because I knew that library was a class act and the musician would be treated well, the library owner would love the music, everything meshed. And then the problem started where it's all of a sudden the musician is telling the library owner, well, I don't think you're right about that. I think we should do it like this. No, just give them what they're asking for and keep doing that over and over. You're gonna make a really good living. And the library owner finally quit working with that person because he was causing too much friction, even though the music was A++. It was as good as it gets. And I remember being at an industry dinner, one of those things in, oh, I can't remember the name, the. Beverly something hotel where they do a lot of music industry like PMC things and a bunch of us were sitting at around to 10 people and that musician's name came up and like four people at the table went oh yeah that guy great music won't touch him with a 10-foot pole so it can come back to bite you even though I don't think any of us has like an official black book list um, you can get yourself a place on the imaginary black book list by just being a pain in the ass and it's so sad <laughs> This business isn't for everyone. Even when I worked for custom music houses, we always had staff composers. And a, a couple times in my career, one of the composers just couldn't handle the feedback. But this is great. This music is great. It's exactly what they want. I wrote what they asked for, and this is it. And I'm, I'm not going to change it. It's like, yeah, but this isn't for you. This, you're not writing music for you. This is for a client who wants, <laughs> who's saying they want it different. So it's just, uh, you're either cut out for the business side of it and the ego submerged side of the business that exists or you're not. And to me, there's two different paths. Some people manage to skirt, uh, to, to kind of be on both sides of the fence, but those are rare individuals. There's, you want to be an artist, you want to come from the heart, you want to express yourself, you want to put your own vision out into the world your way. That is awesome, you know? That's what makes the world go round and makes all of us fall in love with music. And in, in that scenario, you're, you're basically serving yourself and other people are identifying with what you're doing. In, in our world, again, it's all about helping someone tell their story. And it's very collaborative. And it takes someone who can shift on a dime when the client changes their mind or can go in and alter a piece of music they wrote um, because to better serve a client or, or create music that 
has certain um, lyrics and vantage point and follows certain trends because they think that will get it synced. That's coming from a very different place than a 100% artist. And, and like I said, there's those people that do both. They have their artist career and then they have this, like it's an alternate um, persona. They even go by different names. Their I've, artist name is this, and that's who they are online. Yep. But behind the scenes, they have a crap load of production music and songs out there making money. Yeah, there's so, a guy in Nashville that um, makes a million bucks a year placing his stuff in advertising and has an artist career. And the two don't really meet much in the middle. Um, I have, a, I don't know what you would call it, uh, my own little thing that I say to people when trying to describe how to be that person you just described that lives in both worlds and executes them both really well, which is you can paint houses by day to put food on the table and pay your, pay your rent and, and paint your masterpieces, your portraits and your landscapes at night. They both use blending of color. They both use brush strokes. They both have a, a timeline when you should complete stuff, more or less. Uh, anyway, it, it, the jazz guys get really mad when I say that, but everybody else seems fine with it. But I think it would be awesome for everybody who wants to be an artist. Would you rather work as a cashier at a Target or, or do production music? Because you already own the studio. You can already play the instruments. You already know how to write. Just learn the rules of that game over there and play that nine to five to create that income and then go paint masterpieces, make albums for your musical soul every night. Yay, everybody wins. Um, let's talk advertising. Um, it, it's a discipline unto itself. And I've been around uh, back when I used to do audio post at, at HSR in New York. All I did basically, probably 80, 90% of, of what I did was like A-list commercials every day with like huge voiceover people, uh, recorded music with people like Michael Small, you know, living at the top of the food chain in that world. And I often saw how the ad agencies were relatively clueless they would send people in with literally with a paper shopping bag with like seven and a half hips, reel to reel stuff, stuff on cassette. And they'd walk in and go, we, if, like for a Hertz commercial, we need music. We brought some. <laughs> and like, where did you get it? Uh, because oftentimes they were fairly green producers that really didn't understand the rules of the game and how much trouble they could get in by not understanding. So the engineers had to kind of walk them through the process and save their bacon. And they would come in with, it's like, where'd you get that? Oh, a friend of mine gave it to me. Well, <laughs> will it clear? Is it licensable? I don't know, but it's really cool, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I hear so much music and advertising now that is so perfect. The, the, there's no question that the music and advertising has gotten better and better and, and walks those it, that line between the two worlds of artistry and selling something pretty darn well. Is there anything that you can recommend for people who are have an artistic bent that might be an actual working act that's releasing music on Spotify and Apple and wherever? Um, is there anything they can do to make themselves a little sexier for the advertising world that you can think of? Well, the advertising world has gotten a lot more savvy about music and a lot cheaper. <laughs> to say yes. Time. You can't make the kind of money you used to be able to make. Um, and what I find um, with advertising, it, it's, it's all over the map too, but there are certain advertisers that want a buzz band. They want an actual artist that people can go online and listen to, and they have a profile and there they are on Spotify. And they think that that gives their product more legitimacy. There's another layer um, that they don't care who wrote the music. They, it's all about, is the song right for, you know, our product? Is it, us? Is it, is it our brand? Does it reflect our brand well? Um, and there's, a, I'd say that's the majority of advertisers don't 
really need to have an artist attached or a buzz band. Um, and if, if I'm think when I'm writing, if I'm writing a song and I'm thinking that I want to make it placeable in advertising, um, you know, there are certain, um, guidelines, but again, you're not coming from, I'm an artist expressing me. It's hundred percent me. You're writing it to serve a function. So, you know, commercials are, that's where I learned the whole music to picture business. It's 30 seconds usually. Yeah. And there's a lot of focus that goes into a 30 second spot and you've got to get your message across, keep people engaged, tell a story, um, sometimes make it funny in 30 seconds. Well, you, there's not much room for lyric. Right. So Especially when they're very slow in their delivery. <laughs> yeah. You have to have a refrain that's a hook that maybe won't get in until the last five seconds of the spot. But that refrain needs to be somewhat universal. It needs to um, be able to apply to a product, whatever that product might be. Um, and it's almost like the rest of the lyrics don't really matter because they're going right. to mute them anyway. So the production level has to be spot on. You have to sound just as good as the hit records out there. And um, you can make it sound that good. And as you alluded to, you have taxi members who have amazing production shops. You had them when I was there. Um, so the, the beauty of today is that you can create this stuff from your home with the right tools and the right experience. So yeah, I, you know, most of the music on ads is upbeat. It's a certain um, tempo range. Um, of course there are exceptions, um, you know, beyond ads, there's trailers. Songs are huge in trailers. Um, covers are interesting that we keep thinking that trend's going to go away, but it doesn't. Yeah. It's kind of like the happy clappy stuff that took like 12 years to finally diminish a little bit. You're right. The, the, um, reimagined covers thing. Everybody keeps saying, Oh, we're so over that, but they're still out there. <laughs> they're, they're still coming, you know, and, and the ukulele girl singer, that's never going away either. No. <laughs> so I'm, you know, watch ads and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, they're fun when you do get to place one, um, you know, it's, it's exciting, but it's, it's tricky. It is. I think it's really hard for people to not understand or for them to understand that their music is not the star of the 30 seconds. It's just literally the three words in your hook, which are girls night out. That's all yeah. they care. Everything else is rhythm. Maybe the melody matters a little bit, but it's it's almost the tempo feels right to the cut of the picture. And then all of a sudden, girls night out, whatever the product is, you know, <laughs> splash screen with a logo and bye bye. Um, yeah, it, it's. Yeah, it seems like the days of the hundred thousand dollar sink and commercials have been diminished. It, you know what? It, there's so many people that can make great product now. It, it's. Um, a buyer's market, you know, there, there's just a huge supply. It's basic economics. Um, anybody with a MacBook Pro and Logic or, or Pro Tools on it and some good sounding samples and, and some talent and dogged determination because it is a craft and a science and an art all rolled into one thing. It's not about just making pretty music and somebody's going to like it. It's tailoring for that market. And once people get that figured out, and there are a lot that have, so yeah. Um, all right, let's do some Q&A, folks. We've got about 15 minutes left. Um, write the word QUESTION in all caps so I can spot it easily. And uh, I am going to curate. I'm not going to take every question because sometimes people ask stuff that's a little too specific to their world. Um, Here's a question from Liz Rachel Walker. Is there a way to find out which libraries focus on film and TV and which focus on advertising work? Oh, interesting. So there are libraries that focus on songs. 
and then there's libraries that focus on instrumental. Um, Marmoset out of the Northwest is one that started out focusing a lot on songs. Um, they're now, my understanding is getting into instrumental music. Um, another one is um, Tanvi Patel's library. Um, uh, name is escaping me. That's all right. Um, a, a lot of times I try not to mention names in here because people who aren't so professional could see this video and pester the crap out of them. I just saw okay, Tommy, okay, by the way. Yeah. But there, I would divide it more between libraries that specialize in songs and libraries that specialize in underscore. Um, on, and many libraries do both. Yeah. Yeah. It's like those that only did um, instrumental stuff started seeing that people were getting great placements and montages so they opened up their library they went from being a non-exclusive instrumental library to signing songs exclusively and pitching them for the montages and stuff and then oh advertising too and they added it but i i think most libraries have their specialty even though they get into these other areas they're usually better at one thing than they might be at the others but every now and then they might get a, a sync for a song even though they mostly do reality show instrumental stuff um i remember I'm, i found this question uh, interesting does discovery pay royalties because that was an issue at some point in their arc and I don't know that if you even want to take that or talk about it because you're not there anymore. Um, but there was a time when, when they didn't want to pay royalties, and I think they backed off of that or something. Do you remember that whole brouhaha? Do I remember it? Um, <laughs> you lived it? <laughs> I lived it. So I was at Discovery for seven years. and kind of worked my way. I was the first person in the L.A. office, and then it, eventually the L.A. office became kind of the headquarters and I became creative director and um, we, gosh, the money that we brought in over the seven years I was there just was on continual rise. Uh, so when Discovery bought Scripps, um, Scripps does not pay royalties. And it was interesting how this was, uh, how this played out, no one ever consulted the music department about it. Um, they, someone up in the boardroom decided, you know what, when we, since we purchased scripts, let's lay off our entire music department and we'll just use scripts music department and we'll stop paying royalties. Yikes. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> Did so you have a stroke when you heard this? You must have like, this is the worst day of my life. You know, I can't speak poorly of Discovery. They were very, very nice to me. They gave me a beautiful severance package and three months heads up. And um, it was, I just felt left out of the decision making. Um, and in hindsight, you know, it didn't work out too well for them. So Several months in, they decided, okay, now's the time. We're going to stop paying royalties. Well, what you don't understand is all the music that was commissioned during my time and the time that preceded me, there's a composer contract on file. And it guarantees that if any royalties are to be had, that certain amount of royalties will go to the writers. And that's why we could pay them the upfront rates we paid them because the money to be made was on the back end. So you can't just stop paying back end. You would have to go in and replace all that music with something else. So what they then tried to do was contact the major, most um, profusive composers that were on the Discovery Networks um, and do a deal. Hey, we're gonna pay you X amount, maybe it was a yearly thing, um, and we can use your music. It's a royalty-free kind of buyout blanket scenario. Well, all those composers got together through the Production Music um, Association. I remember that meeting quite well. They 
they all came together, band together, and decided absolutely not. Um, you couldn't pay them enough for that deal. You know, yeah. the math just didn't work out. And on Discovery's side, replacing all that music in their hundreds, thousands and thousands of shows going on decades, not even feasible. So it, it died. I'm not going to say it won't be resurrected in some form or another. And for all I know, they may be trying to do those royalty free deals right now going forward with people. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that was a sad attempt, I think, on their part, because the music, what they should have done, if they would have asked me, <laughs> is kept the music department intact and um, taken that wonderful library that, that had been curated over the years and was so well tagged um, and made it available outside of Discovery, like made it available yeah. to the world. and increased their distribution and um you would have doubled revenue. your revenue in 90 days yeah but that's just my opinion well i, I agree know. with your opinion you and i could save the world if people would just turn us loose and <laughs> let us do it <laughs> no it's so obvious I, but you know i can understand a bean counter doesn't know the the ecosystem they just know the beans, but they should rely on somebody that knows the ecosystem to say, how do we get more beans? And you would have told them and they would have been happy. Oh, well. Yeah, well, they're not in the music business there. You know, um, the money we were making, which is substantial in the library world, uh, insignificant in their world. Yeah. You know, so um, I don't, I'm not sure how things are working out. I know a lot of in-house uh, network producers felt when when the music division just left um really felt left stranded because some of their shows really depended heavily on the in-house music supervisors to help get this music out to them and curate their playlists and connect them with composers crazy um any genres that are really hot right now. Uh, a couple people have mentioned this in the chat throughout our conversation. It's like, what should we be working on? Uh, are there trends in general, yes or no? And then if so, what's hot now? I think you couldn't go wrong focusing on yodeling. Um, <laughs> trade secret, no, okay. <laughs> No. All right. So <laughs> all, all of a sudden people are like walking away from their laptops right now and going in the bathroom and practicing their yoga. <laughs> um, you know, hip hop continues to be everywhere and it's always shifting. And um, there's so many iterations of, of hip hop um, and, and the hybrid approach, you know, orchestral hip hop. Um, it's, it's not going anywhere. Um, another trend that doesn't seem to be going away is I call it kind of the um, female noir, emotional kind of cinematic mm -hmm. uh, approach, you know, the bad girl, um, sultry, um, usually somewhat there's strings and electronics involved in it. Um, but very moody. That seems to be popular. Um, what I, what's interesting, because I had a feeling this question would come up, we, we're doing a deal with a very, very large broadcaster, and we're doing some custom music for them, as well as a, a library deal. And they had sent us their genre needs um, about two years ago, and it was ex four pages with examples and um we asked for an update and we just got the update in last week thinking it's going to be pretty much the same it's a lot of pop um all different types of pop it's um a lot of hip-hop and when i say all different kinds of hip-hop it could be aggressive it could be funny it could be emotional um and some, you know, kind of, I call it crime 
uh, music mm -hmm. underscore stuff. But what the two new categories were, were very guitar oriented. Interesting. Um, one was indie rock, um, and the other was heavy metal. Those well, weren't on the list two years ago. <laughs> um, so, do they have a, like a lot of like faster. masculine, you know, like um, car shows, like counting cars or something that they want the medal for? Or is it sports? I'm thinking sports, um, and the indie stuff, same, you know, sports, um, and depending on what type of indie music it is, you know. Um, a lot of shows are starting to use more indie alternative music more and more. So, you know, specific trends are always tricky. Um, it's like, you know, who was the, I, I'm horrible with names on the spot, but it's like, who's the trending artist, you know, that right. becomes a trend for about six months. Um, and then the next trending artist becomes a trend for the next six months. So I'm not sure who's hot now. I mean, we get Dua Lipa, you know, requests. It's like, it just, you know, yeah. top four is always in demand, that sound. Um, uh, do you guys do any work in vintage? Well, that's one of the key attributes of our catalog. We have a library called CPM, which goes back into the 40s and 50s. Wow. Um, what I'll tell you what a trend is that's kind of a difficult one. Authentic archival music. Like they want, they don't want music that sounds like it's from the 70s. They right. want music that's from the 70s. They don't care if it's a known song or not. Usually it's, they don't want a known song. Right. It, it sounds like it's they could just plug it into a 70s show uh, in the background and it's authentic. And that is becoming huge, this authenticity. They want um, Afrobeats, but it has to be from Nigeria. You know, they're getting very specific. Afrobeats is actually a trend. We're you also and I L really need to talk. Um, I'm going to be gone. I'm going to be like completely off the grid for like the next 10 or 12 days. And then after that, I'm going to be out of the country until right before Christmas. Um, early in the new year, you and I need to sit down, you know, in a quiet place for a couple hours. We're the number one supplier to the number one supplier of, um, uh, I can't, vintage music. Um, I think you know the library. I think you probably know the person by name. I won't mention it here because I don't want them to get bombarded. But they love Taxi. We get emails from them practically every day of the week about placements they've had with Taxi members. There is no greater resource on the planet Earth that I'm aware of for vintage music. And our members love it um, because they've had this stuff. You know, look, some of it is recorded on a uh, four track on quarter inch tape back in 1978. But it was decent enough quality, and the quality sometimes is not. It's not they're look, not looking for spectacular engineering; they're looking for authenticity. And they're, we we did a thing with that person I'm talking about on stage at the rally once, where we had people using vintage mics, tape, vintage console, vintage everything, trying to replicate vintage versus stuff that actually was vintage. He could nail it in ten seconds flat and say that one's a knockoff, that one's the real deal. We had a member named Peter Sivo that recorded stuff while he was in the Navy in the 40s. And the stuff sat on a shelf for like 70 years. And we got him a deal with that publisher. And he started making 20, 30 grand a year. And he was now in his 80s and 90s. Wow. I called, yeah, I called him up one day just to say, we're all so proud of you. You know, like out of every one of our members that we've ever had in the 30 year history of taxi, nothing matters to us as much as you. And we're really glad that you're making that kind of money on top of your social security and in your golden years. And he was a little hard of hearing. He started yelling at me, young man, you don't know the first thing about me. It's not about the money. It's about the fact that this, I wanted this music heard by millions of people. And now because of what you connected or who you connected me to, it is being heard by millions of people. And he and I just both started crying on the phone and they died a couple of years later. The publisher, myself, and this elderly gentleman's son, the three of us got on the phone, just like, 
how special is it that what we do, you know, in the grand scheme of things, come on, let's admit it, we're all nothing. We're a tiny little pissant in this little corner of the world. But to deliver somebody's dream that they've held on to so dearly, so deeply for so many years, and that in his last decade of his life, he got to live the dream because of what we all do. So, yeah, you and I really need to talk. A lot has it changed. Like it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I still adore you, and I really appreciate the fact that you took the time to do this. I know how crazy busy you are, and the information that you gave out today is super important that people know this. So thank you, Pat. Um, it's absolutely my pleasure, and I wish I could see everybody and do this in person, but I get it. Uh, times are different now. Yeah. Um, and thank you for asking me. Oh, thank you for saying yes. And I, I will call you um, probably right after the first year. I'm not going to bug you around the holidays, but come on, we're 10 minutes apart. We both eat yeah. food. Uh, let's, yeah. you know, I'm, grab a dinner together yeah. at seven o'clock one night, just so I can, especially the vintage thing. I mean, We've got about four libraries that are using us to source vintage now, but that one, I would say probably 250 to 300 placements a year of taxi members. Um, yeah, I should be doing that with you too. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, let's hang out. Um, thank you very much. Bye. Have a great rest of your day, great rest of your week, and I will talk to you somewhere around the end of the year, early next, all right? Sounds good. Thank, Thank you, you Pat. Bye-bye.